Good morning. Good morning, brother. Thank you. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, it's a privilege to bring you the Word of God and uh, lead us in our worship through the Word. <clears throat> and uh, this morning, what I'd like to do is cover an entire Old Testament book. Now, before you panic, um, I'm talking about the shortest book in the Old Testament, Obadiah. Uh, only 21 verses, but still 21 verses for a single sermon is significant. So it, it, looking more at an overview of some ideas uh, today instead of just an in-depth uh, exegetical analysis of the uh, text, we want to get the main point and we want to we want to see God today. We want to enjoy beholding him from this book. And so as we go through Obadiah, we will be looking to see his beauty. Now, um, as I've wrestled through the book, and uh, I wanted to share with you uh, a thought about the Bible. <clears throat> and the, here's my thought. Um, the Bible is kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. I don't know if many of you like to do those. My wife loves those things and pours them all out on the table, and I just, and she starts putting them together, and man, this beautiful picture starts to happen, and each piece fits in there to contribute to that picture. And uh, Bible study is kind of like that. Um, in our MTP classes, we talk about uh, uh, the big picture of the Bible, uh, the storyline of the Bible, and things like that. And so how do, you, how do you get that? You start to study, you start to read, you start to think from Genesis on through, and you start to see some things that are, that, that, that are consistent, and you start to see that this is about God and his glory. And uh, he's a God who uh, makes promises um, as we move forward, and he has a purpose and a goal. Uh, of course, it's his glory. His glory is always the goal of what he does, but a story develops. And uh, <clears throat> over the past 40-some years as I've looked at it, I have a, a storyline for the Bible. Um, so I'll share that with you. And there's other storylines, but this is how I would sum it up as I've, because when you put those pieces together, as you move along, man, uh, that picture does develop. And, and as, you're, as you get closer to fitting it together, you see this glorious manifestation of a beautiful Christ as God is moving to set him on display to the glory of his name. And that's kind of how I define the storyline. <clears throat> Here it is. God's purpose in creation is to glorify himself, his name, through the exaltation of the Son as the, the one who reveals God to the creation in his redemptive and ruling and reconciling work. And texts like Colossians 1, 15 through 17, just a tremendous text that talks about the, the priority of Christ. I, I think I'll even just look it up and read it that set the tone for this kind of statement in Colossians. It's, I have it memorized, but I'm, I wouldn't dare try to say it in front of everybody because I'll forget. Here it is. <clears throat> Paul talks about giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him or in him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, 
And in him all things hold together. He's also head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything where it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness of deity to dwell in him. And through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, that text is the foundation for how I view the storyline. Now, we also study in class how the parts have to fit in with the whole, you see. You have a, you have a big picture, but the parts. And, and that's how a jigsaw puzzle works. You, you, you have a piece, and, and I don't understand how that fits in, but when you find it, it fits. And Obadiah is kind of like that. It's one of the pieces in the puzzle as this storyline unfolds. And we're going to see that it's about one of the foundational truths about God that make the storyline work, okay? Because the storyline, as we see it unfold, is uh, fit together with some very important ideas, some very important covenant promises that God makes as he reveals himself to us in the scriptures as this wonderful God and King of Israel is how it begins and starts with the Abrahamic covenant. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today. And that covenant is foundational for all that God does after that, after the fall and the separation of Adam from the presence of God and relationship ruined and and his rule over the creation just subverted, severed from God. And so at the end of chapter 11 in Genesis, it's like, what's going to happen? The Abrahamic covenant. And God begins working through the scriptures to bring Christ and set him on display. And, and, and the great covenants like the Davidic covenant, the new covenant, unconditional covenants, even the Mosaic covenant foundational to this plan to see Christ set on display. So how does Obadiah fit in, you might say? How does this peace work? Well, we're going to see that one of the wonderful truths about Obadiah as we read it, and it's a book about judgment, really. Judgment on the nation of Edom, and we'll see some other things as well, but it's God in the midst of it being faithful to the Abrahamic covenant. And we're we're going to see that. You remember that great covenant? Now the Lord said to Abraham, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in you, praise God for this, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Wow, foundational. We're going to see how he curses Edom from Esau. So, the outline this morning as we go through this to see God's character. And by the way, when we talk about his faithfulness to these covenant promises, We're talking about his loving kindness, his faithfulness, his truth. Loving kindness is faithful, loyal, covenant-keeping love. It's what we need from God in our relationship with him. He's made great promises to us in Christ, and he will never go back on his word. He's a God of faithful, loyal, covenant-keeping love. He has been from the beginning, and he will be for all eternity, okay? So we want to see that today. We're, all, we're, we're not only going to see that in his destruction of Edom and why he does it, but there's also a wonderful part of the book at the end, the, the eschatological part. And we're going to see the Christological connection when we get there and how it is about this coming beautiful Messiah. And it's interesting, as we go along, we'll see some things about Obadiah and things he understood and how he speaks so briefly about things, but there's more to it. 
with him. So, here we go. We'll cover the, <clears throat> we will cover the, the points that have to do with the destruction of Edom, the reason for that destruction, the day of the Lord that's coming, and then the restoration of Israel. Those four things are part of this book. So let's begin as we move through it. The author is Obadiah. We don't know much about him. All we have is what's in the book. One commentator uh, said that possibly his parents may have been, uh, when they named him Obadiah, it means a, a servant of God, a worshiper of Yahweh. Maybe they were having those kind of hopes for their child. And as he grew up, God used him to present this message, to be a prophet, give, gave him a vision, Obadiah. The date is interesting. There's two different time frames that could be uh, written. There's an early date, an early date, 848 to 841, and Dr. Uh, uh, oh, I lost track of his name. Chisholm, Dr. Chisholm from Dallas Seminary said this. He said, it may have originated in the aftermath of the Edomite rebellion against Judah in the ninth century during the reign of Joram, and he gives the, gives the references. However, and I agree with this, however, the events of this period hardly fit the picture of Judah's demise painted in Obadiah 10 through 14, and we're going to see how horrible it is. Though Philistines and Arabian tribes invaded Judah and looted the royal palace during the reign of Joram, the account in Second Chronicles, it says, makes no mention of Edomite involvement, nor does it give any indication that Judah was devastated to the degree described by Obadiah. It's far more likely that Obadiah prophesied in the aftermath of the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C., which culminated in the exile of large, of course, segments of the population. And like Obadiah, other texts dating from this time, and we're going to see some of them as we go through, denounce Edom's involvement in Judah's demise. In fact, you can see correspondences between uh, Obadiah and Jeremiah's writings, and they debate who wrote and how did they uh, write the same things. And so it's very possible that Obadiah was referencing even Jeremiah. So uh, if we agree with the later date about the time of that destruction of Jerusalem in 586, then we have a situation that's different if it was written earlier on for Obadiah. Okay? It means that uh, the nation was destroyed under Nebuchadnezzar, but here's also what it means. When we hear Obadiah talk about things in the book like the day of the Lord, a couple verses, and then the coming of the kingdom, Obadiah has had access to a wealth of the scriptures that have been written up to this point, and, and so many of the prophets talk about these glorious coming events, this judgment by God on the world, the coming Messiah and the kingdom. So when he throws out a couple references about the day of the Lord, there's a wealth and depth of understanding in that theme that has to be brought to the table. When he talks about the kingdom, we'll see he had access to these, some of the great texts that talk about the coming Messiah and what he would do and how that kingdom would be established. So we're going to see that Christological connection that he would have understood because of his place in history. His book was not written in a vacuum. The man was a theologian, like many of the prophets, studying, thinking, Daniel had send me Jeremiah's writings so I can understand and think and read. He wasn't, he wasn't writing in a vacuum. Now, we know about Edom somewhat, a nation which came from Esau, right? That amazing uh, situation in Genesis with regard to Jacob and Esau. 
Uh, he lived to the southeast of Judah in the mountainous terrain known as Mount Seir. That's where God allotted for him to have a place. There was perpetual hatred and opposition by Edom against Israel. And you can see it just starts right at the beginning, doesn't it? You remember what happened uh, in the womb, right? Genesis 25. 22 through 26, but the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it is so, why then am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger, you see. And, and when they came out, Jacob and Esau... Esau was named Esau because he came forth red all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. Afterward, Jacob came out, holding on to Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. So twins, twins, twins. We'll talk some more about that as we go along. But there was this conflict and you remember how the birthright was despised by Esau. And he, he wanted some stew. Oh, I don't who, I'm going to die. Who cares about the birthright? So he sells it. So when it comes time to get blessed by Jacob, or I'm sorry, by Isaac, then he deceives. His mother is involved with this deception, but she has this message from God. And so he deceives his father, and he gets the blessing of the Abrahamic covenant. The blessing of the Abrahamic covenant. And when Esau comes in and wants the blessing, it's gone. And uh, what did he do? Well, Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near then I will kill my brother Jacob. We're going to see that when God makes choices, people hate it when God makes choices. So there's this conflict, and throughout their history, one commentator said this, Edom was noted in the Bible for its pride, treachery, greed, and violence. He has all the references. Conflict between Israel and Edom was foreshadowed by that struggle even in the womb. The incident that initiated and fed the conflict. You remember when Israel was heading for the promised land and they wanted to go through Edom's territory? We're your brother. We won't touch anything. Just let us go through. No. In fact, we're going to come out with an army against you. There's just this constant, constant hatred of uh, Edom for Israel. They fought through most of their history. Um, but Edom made themselves, he says, especially odious with this event, with Nebuchadnezzar coming down, and we'll see how they responded to that. Plundered Jerusalem. They participated in it. They participated in it. Now, the audience, it wasn't like Jonah going to Nineveh. It, it, this, the, the book is written probably, most likely delivered to the Jewish survivors of Jerusalem's destruction, okay? And, and, and it should have been a great encouragement to know that Edom's treachery against them would not go unpunished. In fact, all the enemies of God and his people would receive justice. We're going to see that because what happens with Edom is coming in the day of the Lord for all nations. We'll see it. And what seemed to be the end for God's people would not be the end after all. Why? Because God is faithful to his word. He's faithful to his word. So, we've talked about the brief outline, so let's dig in. First, God's intent to destroy the proud, arrogant, self-assured nation of Edom. Wow. And we'll read through it. We, we're going to read through the text as we move through, uh, Lord willing. The vision of Obadiah, it's a vision. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report 
from the Lord, and an envoy has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, let us go against them for battle. So the prophecy opens with this divine stamp of approval upon the message given by Obadiah. It's the Lord God, Yahweh, his revelation concerning his intended warfare against Edom. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. God, it says. The Lord greatly despises Edom. Uh, That's to regard with contempt or disdain. And in contrast to their exalted view of themselves, he is going to make them absolutely insignificant among the nations. One commentator said he's going to cut them down to size. What's going on with them? You, you get it, right? Pride, arrogance. Verse 3, the arrogance of your heart has deceived you. People pride. Self-exaltation, self-centered thinking will deceive you. Deceive them. You who live in the clefts of the rock, in the loftiness of your dwelling place, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to earth? Rhetorical question. Though you build high like the eagle, though you set your nest among the stars from there, I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Amazing. The pride and arrogance of the Edomites had deceived them into a false sense of security with respect to their nation's location, Mount Seir, mountainous area where they built their cities and dwellings. They were trusting in their mountain fortress, their alliances, and their wise men, and they were taking pride in these things. One commentator described the placement of their citadel Petra or Selah, it's also called that, meaning rock or cliff. The city itself was carved out of the rock with cliffs surrounding it of almost 2,000 feet. The entrance to the city was a small, narrow, binding crevice in the rocks that only allowed a single horseman to pass in certain places. They believed that no one could conquer them. So their rhetorical question is answered by God himself. Though you build high like the eagle, wow, majestic, soaring, though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Now, dear people, I don't know about you, but we live in a very proud, self-exalting, self-confident nation. We think that we have what we need, food, clothing, shelter. We have military might. We have all these things. You know how this would apply. Where is our trust? What about personally? You know, this whole idea of uh, how we start to panic. Man, I've even talked with folks that when this next election, you better start putting stuff away because there's going to be a civil war or something going on. Well, God brings nations down. God exalts nations. And we need to remember who it is that rules over this nation. Okay? And now Obadiah describes their fall. This is interesting. Uh, Listen to what he says. If thieves come to you, thieves come to you. If robbers by night, oh, how you will be ruined. Would they not steal only until they had enough? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave some gleanings? Oh, how Esau will be ransacked and his hidden treasures searched out. So uh, this is a judgment that's going to bring a total a total annihilation, totally ransacked and ruined. The, the searching out of his treasures, even the ancient Greek historian Diodorus Siculius indicates that the Edomites put their wealth accumulated from trade in, in vaults, in the rocks, and, and all that they've piled up is going to get taken away. Now, here's how it happened. This is really, I think, kind of amazing. 
all the men allied with you will send you forth to the border. And the men at peace with you will deceive you and overpower you. They who eat your bread will set an ambush for you. And then he makes a parenthetical idea. There's no understanding in him. See, they prided themselves in their wise men and counselors. So how the Lord does not even need to bring an assault against their mountain fortress by armies from the outside. He doesn't have, even have to do that. He can bring them down from within through the betrayal of their trusted allies. Isn't that amazing? I'm going to bring you down. Oh, nobody can reach us. Well, I'm going to do it through those you trust. Through those you trust. And the Lord will not allow them to understand the treachery and the plotted, the plots against them. As we read in verse 8, Will not I on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountain of Esau? I'm not going to let you catch on to this because I'm going to bring you down. Then your mighty men will be dismayed, O Teman, so that everyone may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter. The, the, the mighty men, the, the, these are their strongest warriors. They're going to be dismayed. That has to do with being filled or gripped with fear and terror. You know, how, I mean, that can immobilize you. Mighty warriors are turned into terrified cowards because God is bringing them down so that everyone may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter. Pride is one of the most abominable sins to the Lord, isn't it? There's no room for pride in our relationship with him. There's no room for pride in coming to him by grace through faith. There's no boasting in that. We boast only in the cross, right? There's no pride. But men pride themselves in their relationship with false gods and build themselves up and like Paul before he was converted climb the ladder to be somebody trusting in everything else but God pride God hates pride doesn't he he hates it he hates it A couple texts Proverbs 8:13 the fear of the Lord is to hate evil the fear of the Lord is to hate evil Pride and arrogance go together, as we see with Edom, and the evil way, and the perverted mouth. I hate. God hates it. Peter said, young men, likewise, be subject to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Believers are humble people not proud, because we understand what God has done to rescue us and the cost that was made for our sins to be forgiven through the, through the Lord Jesus. So that's the implication for us. May we not get tripped up by self-centered, prideful, arrogant thinking. And we're going to see how that's expressed now. God intends to destroy Edom because of, their arrogant, because of their arrogant hatred toward God and his people, Israel, in verses 10 through 14. So because of violence, we're going to kind of read through it, but you can, I don't have to explain this, you'll hear it. Because of violence to your brother, Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever, Okay? cut off forever, and here's what it looked like. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you too were as one of them. You were right there. Psalm 137.7, which is, was probably a psalm written during the exile, says this, Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, Razit, Razit to the ground, 
Raz it to its very foundation. Go, Nebuchadnezzar, destroy the city. Destroy it. We hate them. So do not gloat over your brother's day, the day of his misfortune. And do not rejoice over the sons of Judah in the day of their destruction. Yes, do not boast in the day of their distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their disaster. Yes, you do not gloat over their calamity in the day of their disaster. And do not loot their wealth in the day of their disaster. I mean, he's just driving it home. And all these do nots are a wonderful way of saying, you've already done it. You've already done it. You're being accused here. Do not loot their wealth in the day of their disaster. Do not stand at the fork of the road to cut down their fugitives. And do not imprison their survivors in the day of their distress. Well, I'll tell you, Edom truly, don't you think, reflects Uh, what Jim read earlier from Psalm 83. Let me read that again. Oh God, do not remain quiet. You can hear We're in a covenant relationship with you. Do not be silent. And oh God, do not be still. For behold, your enemies, your enemies, make an uproar. And, And you will see in this psalm that hatred for God and the people of Israel go together. You can't separate them in God's mind, and you can't separate it in the hearts of people. Do not be still, for behold, your enemies make an uproar. Man, this is is very similar to Psalm 2. We'll look at that maybe. Your enemies make an uproar, and those who hate you will have exalted themselves. They make shrewd plans against your people, comprised together against your treasured ones. They have said, come and let us wipe them out as a nation. You see, they're a nation. They're just not a group of Jews floating around the earth. They're a nation. That the name of Israel be remembered no more. Has anything changed today? No. Look at the Middle East. Look at the world. Hate God, hate Israel. Let's, let's just wipe their name out. We, don't, we want to remove them from the earth. For they have conspired together with one mind against you. They make a covenant. And the first name listed in the signers of this covenant the tents of Edom, first name. And then it lists a bunch more. So there are other texts where God says what he's going to do. Ezekiel 25, 12 and 13. Thus says the Lord God, because Edom has acted against the house of Judah by taking vengeance and has incurred grievous guilt and avenged themselves upon them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will also stretch out my hand against Edom and cut off man and beast from it. And I will lay it waste from Teman even to Dedan. They will fall by the sword. Okay. Ezekiel 35. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Mount Seir. Prophesy against it and say to it, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, Mount Seir, and I will stretch out my hand against you and make you a desolation and a waste. I will lay waste your cities and you will become a desolation. You will become a desolation. Then you will know what's the purpose that I am Yahweh. Because you have had everlasting enmity against your brother and have delivered the sons of Israel to the power of the sword at the time of their calamity. Wow. Wow. God's going to bring them down. You know that in the Bible, Edom 
you know, there's many, many texts where you have lists of God judging the nations, and Edom is the one that has the most texts directed against them. They essentially, uh, as we will see, become like the archetypical nation that hates God. <laughs> they're, they're the great example of it. So we're going to look... We're going to look at the day of the Lord and the coming consummated kingdom, and that's going to get us into the Christological connection by Obadiah. But first, let me just talk with you about this. First, I want to look at Edom and Israel in verses 10 through 14. And you notice as we read those verses, do not do this because this is the day of their distress, again and again and again and again. Okay, let's talk about that. God is going to judge Edom because of their rejoicing and gloating and participating in Israel's day of calamity and distress. But remember why Israel is undergoing this horrific day of calamity. Why? Because they've violated the, the Mosaic Covenant. They have not obeyed God. They don't love God. Their great sin against God, the only true and living God. Their sin far exceeds the sin of their brother Edom because as Jeremiah declared in Jeremiah 2, 9 through 13, therefore I will contend with you, declares the Lord, and with your sons, sons, I will contend. For cross to the coastlands of Kittim and see, and send to Kedar and observe closely, and see if there has been such a thing as this. Just go from east to west including Edom. Has a nation changed gods when they were not gods? And you know what's interesting? Earlier on in the history of Israel, they went in and defeated Edom. And guess what the king did when he defeats Edom? He's proud. He takes Edom's gods and worships them. But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder. Be very desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water, putrefied little bits of stagnant nothing, instead of the living God, the fountain of life. Wow. So Israel's being judged by God because of their stubborn, rebellious, rebellious hard-hearted sin against him. So let's, let's focus now on the difference between Israel and Edom as God brings judgment on both nations. There's, <laughs> there's no difference in terms of their sinfulness because of their sin. Edom is going to be utterly destroyed and wiped off the planet. But we will see that Israel has the hope of future restoration. Why? You know the answer. I think Paul helps us. God's a God who makes choices. Sovereign individuals, nations. God made the choice between the boys and Rebecca's womb. Paul says in Romans 9, 10 through 13, and not only this, as he's, he's talking about God's elective purposes, even within the elect nation of Israel, not all the Jews will be saved. And not only this, but there was Rebecca also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, they, they Jacob didn't get the blessing because Esau sold his birthright. Paul says, not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand. Not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, we read it earlier, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob, I loved, but Esau, I hated. He made a choice. 
Does God have the right to do that? Yes, he does. He has the right to do that. He has the right to do that. So that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand. And this choice of, and and why does he do these things? For his own glory, right? We know the big picture. But in this particular little book, we're going to see that the choice of Jacob over Esau or Edom, Israel over Edom, and it's, consequences and, 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 and what they are. Let me read you some of the consequences of this choice. Remember in Exodus 3 when God's going to deliver Israel. God furthermore said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, not the God of Esau, could have been, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. So so God now has entered into this relationship with Jacob, but not Esau. Not Esau, with Jacob. And once God has made this decision, his loving kindness will not be shaken in his commitment to this covenant. Not be shaken. It doesn't matter how bad their sin is. Under the Mosaic Covenant, he made a promise to the fathers, and he will not break it. Deuteronomy 7, 7 and 8, The Lord did not set his love on you, his love on you, this nation, nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but because the Lord loved you, And kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers. The Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And we read in other places, he did it to make a name for himself. See, God's about his glory. He destroyed Egypt so that the world would know that Yahweh is God. The God and king of Israel. The only true God. Deuteronomy 10. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Yet on your fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them. Wow. And he chose their descendants after them, even you above all peoples, as it is this day. You know, dear folks, that goes right to Romans chapter 11, where Paul's talking about an apostate nation that's being Hardened by God to bring Gentiles into kingdom citizenship. But he's not done with them because they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. He's going to fulfill his word with them. They're going to be saved just as it is written. And we're going to talk about restoration texts for them. And the text from which Paul quotes in Malachi 1, 1 through 4, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau, and I have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Though Edom says we have been beaten down, but we will return and build up our ruins, thus says the Lord of hosts. They may build, but I will tear down. And the men will call them, the men will call them the wicked territory and the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever. And because of God's love for Israel, what happens? Because of his love in this covenant with Abraham, in spite of their continued national sin, Malachi 3.6, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O Israel, are not consumed by my wrath. You can read about it in Hosea, his love for them. He won't consume them. He made a promise. So this is God's sovereign plan. God's elective choice. Is it any wonder that the world even today reflects Psalm 83, 4? Let us wipe them out as a nation. 
that the name of Israel be remembered no more. People hate a God who makes sovereign choices. You're not in control. He's in control. Throughout their history, Israel has been a hated people. God's choice. Okay? God's choice. And now we're going to get to the eschatological part of the book. Now we're going to get to the idea of the Christological connection in Obadiah. Christological connection. <clears throat> when God made that choice of Jacob over Esau, God the Father determined that the plan that brings the most glory to his name was to, to send the eternal divine son into history to empty himself and take to himself the full human nature of one human being, the son of David. The descendant of David, the shepherd boy from the tribe of Judah. This descendant would fulfill God's promise to David. Your house, David, and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Dear people, that is an eternal promise. Eternal promise. Right now, the Lord Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. As promised in Psalm 110, the great priest king of the kingdom of God. It's who he is. And, and, and Obadiah, we're going to see, understood these great truths about the Messiah, I believe. So now we're going to finish Obadiah, Lord willing, fastly. Fastly. We'll look at these two great eschatological events anticipated by the Old Testament saints, and they're both throughout the prophets, throughout the Old Testament. Many of these things written about this, the, the day of the Lord and the coming glorious kingdom, Obadiah was privy to, read, studied, thought through. So all he has to do is mention this. In the coming day of the Lord, judgment, God will destroy all the nations that hate him and his people Israel. And there, here's a key, key verse in the book, really, that shows this reflection of the Abrahamic covenant. Retributive justice. As you have done, nations, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head. Wow. God's going to make sure that happens. Because just as you drank on my holy mountain, all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and swallow and become as if they had never existed. So the destruction of Edom here, dear people, stands as an archetypical example of the judgment that God is going to bring on the nations, all the nations that reflect the heart and attitude of Edom proud, arrogant, self-assured, God-hating people and nations opposed to his divine purpose to exalt Christ the Messiah to the glory of his name are going to be judged in the coming worldwide judgment. Isn't that amazing? The Edomites rejoiced at the downfall of Israel, even celebrating on Mount Zion. Mount Zion! in their hatred of God and their brother Jacob. <clears throat> like Edom, all the nations will one day drink the cup of God's wrath in the coming day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a theme throughout the prophets that Obadiah was familiar with. So when he says that, all the weight of that comes to bear. A good example is Isaiah 13. <clears throat> he probably knew this for sure. This coming judgment, Isaiah says this. By the way, it follows after the judgment of Babylon because the day of the Lord judgment on specific nations at specific times prefigures this final coming horrific day of the Lord that's coming soon for us, for the nations today. It's not happening now, it's coming. Paul talks about that. Jesus talks about it in the Olivet Discourse, Paul in Thessalonians. 
Wail. Through Isaiah, God says, Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will fall limp, and every man's heart will melt like the Edomites. They will be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. They will look at one another in astonishment, their faces aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger to make the land a desolation, and he will exterminate its sinners from it. From it. This just isn't about one nation. This is bigger. <laughs> For the stars of the heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Signs in the heavens, that, Jesus talked about that accompanying his second coming. Thus I will punish, I will punish the world for its evil. Can you imagine the stench of evil that's rising to the throne room of God from this earth today? I'm going to punish the world. He's so patient. His patience has a limit. And the wicked for their iniquity. I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. I will make mortal man scarcer than pure gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken from its place. Read Revelation. Earthquake that levels every mountain and island moved out of its place in the day of the Lord. at the fury of the Lord of hosts in the day of his burning anger. Now, I don't want to be viewed as fire and brimstone. But I'll tell you what. I thought about coming up this morning with a, a sign, you know, like one of them signs, those old guys, repent, the end is near. And everybody runs by their cars doing their thing, and they just laugh at them. I'm telling you right now, repent, for the end is near. That's absolutely true. There's a judgment coming, just like the flood. Worldwide catastrophe, it's coming. It's coming. And John the Baptist uses imagery that confirms it's the Messiah who's going to bring this day of the Lord judgment. The Messiah. Luke 13, 7. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. It's a fiery judgment, Peter says. Not like the watery judgment, first time. Fire, judgment by fire, it's a whole different thing. Revelation tells us that Jesus Christ is the one who treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. Wow. My loving Savior, yes, he, to vindicate his Father's name, he will crush this earth with judgments that are unspeakable. And they're coming. As he pours out the future, future cataclysmic divine judgment on earth, the Messiah will execute the day of the Lord judgment. There's this Christological connection. But then also we have the fact that God promises the exiled nation of Israel restoration and redemption in the coming messianic kingdom of God. And Obadiah describes this reversal of fortune for Israel when the eschatological kingdom will be the Lord's. See, that's a, that's a key idea. The kingdom will be the Lord's. He understands. Daniel speaks of this kingdom being established when the Son of Man will come with the clouds of heaven, receiving the kingdom from the Ancient of Days. Jesus talks about coming in the Olivet Discord on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory to establish his kingdom. The whole purpose of the book of Revelation is summed up in chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is to be. Amen. Speaking of Christ's return in Revelation 19. And then verses 17 through 21, and believe me, I studied through this and some of the names and some of the places. The bottom line is, you read this text in the context of the kingdom that's coming, okay? And so in, in this text, Edom uh, uh, does function 
According to Dr. Chisholm, the cosmic dimensions of the prophecy transcend historical developments because when the day of the Lord comes, when the kingdom comes, Edom's gone. God has wiped them out a long time ago. But they're an archetype, right? Archetypical of any nation that's going to stand against God. Edom is the great example. I'm going to bring them down. I'm going to bring them down. So it talks about that. This is about an end time judgment of worldwide proportions. So they're this archetype of all God's enemies who will be crushed. And so in that text, you have the Jews coming back, repopulating. Their Messiah's coming to do battle for them. They're, gonna, they're like fire, house of Joseph, a flame. The house of Esau, there's this comparison. You're going to come back and be blessed and exalted, and Esau's going to be rubble and exterminated. That's what God's going to do because of his promise. The Lord has spoken. Then those in the Negev will possess the mountain of Esau. See, it's, it, they're, going to be, they're going to be brought back in peace and safety. Their enemies will be destroyed. And, and we don't have time to go into all the names, but they're very real names, and they talk about exiles returning from faraway places back to the land. The land. And the kingdom will be the Lord's. Amen? And that's a messianic reality for Obadiah. He's coming again. So let me just... I'm not going to read the text in Ezekiel. You can go read it where... Just write down in your notes Ezekiel 37, 21 through 28. And you'll see how under Messiah they're brought back to the land after they're regenerated under new covenant blessing. It's very wonderful. So, let me just close with this. Boy, the great need of the hour for everyone sitting in this room is to humble yourself before the Almighty God. It's like Psalm 110. Don't, don't resist. Bow before the King, the Son of David, the Savior. You see, it's the King's blood that purchases citizens into the kingdom. The Son of David's blood purchases citizens into the kingdom that he's going to rule over for all eternity. So, if that's true, if he's bringing this judgment, what do you need to do? You need to have the one who's going to bring the judgment rescue you from the judgment, and he can do it. How does that happen? You must, you must come to him as the one who bore the sins of his people, Jews and Gentiles, on the cross, taking God's full wrath against your sin, all of it, so that you will not have to suffer through this judgment of the day of the Lord. We're not destined for that, Paul says, as the church. So that you can be delivered from that and have eternal, wonderful love relationship with the Father because Jesus paid it all for you. So he's coming to judge, but he can save you from that judgment. Embrace him by faith. Trust in him as your all in all. Please, because it may be happening very soon. Very soon. May the Lord cause you to open your eyes to see his beauty as not only the king and the judge, but the savior, the beautiful savior from all judgment. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this book of Obadiah, a book that has to do with your loving kindness and faithfulness to your word, to even deal with a nation like Israel over the centuries you, you, as they have spurned you and not turned to you, and yet you have not destroyed them because you are a God of faithfulness and loving kindness and truth. Thank you for that. Thank you that your promises are sure. The promises you've made to us in Christ are sure. The promises you have made to them are sure. Your word is forever settled in heaven. You will fulfill what you say you're going to do. And you have always done that. 
So, Father, cause people to flee today from the wrath to come, this horrible judgment that the Messiah is going to pour out on a wicked world. May you, Jesus, be the hope of everyone in here. Deliver them from wrath by your own personal sacrifice, bearing the fullness of that wrath in the place of sinners. I pray that no one would leave here without being a reality for them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.